The physical system is stable. The biological engine, the biofilter, is much more dynamic, especially between different experimental runs, which likely started with biofilters at different maturation stages. So the nitrifying microorganisms, mm -hmm. they take time to establish and stabilize. Weeks, sometimes months. And that maturation state dramatically impacts how the system handles nitrogen. So even in this highly controlled facility, the biofilter stage of development introduces significant variability early on. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best, you can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. This episode is inspired by the 2022 article titled, Evaluation of a Recirculating Aquaculture System Research Facility Designed to Address Current Knowledge Needs in Atlantic Salmon Production by Moda Vasco C. et al. Welcome back. Today we're diving into something really core to modern salmon production, recirculating aquaculture systems, or RAS. We're seeing this huge pivot, especially for smolt and post-smolt. It's definitely the trend. Driven by needing tighter environmental control, better biosecurity, you look at Norway, what, 70% of smolts are RAS-based now? It's significant. Absolutely. But uh, moving indoors hasn't solved everything, has it? Pathogens are still a, a major headache. That's the crucial point. You still get outbreaks. Things like Yersinia ruckery, IPNV, they can thrive in these intensive, complex systems. High density doesn't help either. And when you're doing research in these systems, getting reliable, repeatable results is paramount. Bad data leads to bad decisions, potentially very costly ones. Precisely. Which brings us to the work by Moda, Vasco C., and his colleagues. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority? We don't sell ads. We elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Their study evaluates a specific RAS research facility designed to tackle these very issues head on. Right, the mission here was to build a system that allows for statistically solid reproducible research something the industry desperately needs. So let's unpack the technical benchmarks they set. The absolute core idea was tackling pseudo-replication. That historical problem where tanks sharing water were treated as independent, which they just aren't. It invalidates results, essentially. Yeah. So how did this facility design achieve true experimental independence? That's the million dollar question. Well, they didn't cut corners. The facility has nine fully independent RES units. And when I say independent, I mean completely separate. Okay, just fine, completely separate. What does that look like structurally? Each unit is its own mini RAS, about 0.8 cubic meters total volume with a half cubic meter fish tank. Each one has its own water treatment train, its own everything, no shared water loops between the experimental units. That modularity is key then eliminates the risk of, say, a treatment in one unit affecting another. Exactly. It's the only way to confidently run multiple different trials, maybe infection, nutrition, disinfection at the same time. Let's talk components then. What's in the treatment train for each of these nine units? Yeah. The specifics matter for performance. They do. So each one starts with a microscreen drum filter, 40 micron mesh, standard solid removal. Okay. Then the biofilter, a moving bed bioreactor, an MBBR. Critically, they used a 50% media fill. A 50% fill. Yeah. That provides a pretty substantial surface area, right? Huge. 750 square meters per cubic meter. That gives you robust biological capacity, vital for handling the swings you might see in challenge trials. Makes sense. What else? Each unit also had its own protein skimmer with the option for ozonation, plus degassing and UV disinfection capabilities. Options being key there allows researchers to isolate the effect of specific treatments like ozone or UV. Precisely. It gives you that fine grain to control over experimental variables. Now, facility level biosecurity. They're working with pathogens, so containment is critical. It's biosafety level two, you mentioned. Yes, BSL2. And a major part of that is handling the wastewater. You can't just discharge water that might contain pathogens. So what's the protocol? Rigorous heat treatment. All effluent water is heated to 89 degrees Celsius and held there for at least 15 minutes before it can be discharged. 89 degrees for 15 minutes, that's thorough, ensures nothing viable gets out. 
complete inactivation. It's essential for research integrity and protecting the surrounding environment. Though you have to imagine the energy cost for that kind of heat treatment is significant. That wouldn't be typical for a commercial setup. Oh, absolutely not. This facility is designed for generating high certainty data, not for commercial production economics. The cost reflects the priority, data integrity above all else. It proves BSL-2 can be done in RAS research, but highlights the cost barrier for commercial farms. Okay, so the infrastructure is robust, independent, and secure. How did they prove it works in practice, the versatility aspect? They ran five different independent experimental trials, really put the system through its paces. What kinds of trials? A mix. They did a nutrition and smultification trial looking at dietary fat impacts. But the really interesting ones, I think, were the pathogen challenges. How did they simulate infection? Two ways. First, a waterborne challenge using Y ruckery like a sudden contamination event. Second, they used infected fish as vectors to study horizontal transmission, different dynamics. Right. Crucial difference there. Water treatment efficacy versus, say, population health management. Exactly. And they also ran detailed chemical disinfection trials using parasitic acid. Common disinfectant in the industry. What do they test? They looked at continuous dosing at both low 0.1 milGL and high 1 milGL concentrations. And importantly, they compared continuous dosing versus pulse dosing over nearly a month. That pulse versus continuous comparison that really requires those independent systems you mentioned earlier. Couldn't do it reliably otherwise. And speaking of reliability, they also validated their cleaning protocol between trials. You can't have carryover. Good point. What did that involve? An alternating sequence of acidic washes below pH 4 and alkaline washes above pH 12. Really harsh conditions. Did it work? How did they check? It worked perfectly. They used PCR screening on tank surfaces, plumbing, everywhere, looking for Y ruckery DNA after cleaning. Found nothing. Came back clean. That's a huge validation for running sequential infection studies. <laughs> okay, let's shift from the physical setup to the numbers. The statistical findings are really the core takeaway for researchers planning studies. Definitely. The big number here is the intra-class correlation coefficient, the ICC. They found it averaged around 0.1 across the different trials. Okay, ICC of 0.1. Remind us why a low ICC is so important here. What does it actually signify? It measures how much of the total variation in your results is due to differences between the tanks rather than within the tanks. A low ICC, like 0.1, means the tanks are behaving very, very similarly. So no weird tank effects are driving the results. The systems are truly acting as independent replicates. Exactly that. It proves the independence they engineered actually works in practice. The variability is where it should be mostly among the fish within each tank, not because one tank is fundamentally different from another. And that high reproducibility, what does it mean for designing experiments? Sample sizes? Statistical power? It means you can achieve high statistical power with fewer resources. Their calculations showed sampling just 15 fish per tank across the nine units, so typically three tanks per treatment, gives you 80% power to detect medium to large effects. 15 fish per tank. That's efficient. Supports the three R's principle reduction, refinement, replacement. Less animal use for robust results. Precisely. It's ethical and economical. Okay, so the system allows for precise, efficient experiments. But you remember on water quality earlier, there was a bit of a paradox there regarding stability, wasn't there? Ah, uh, yes. This is where the biology meets the engineering. Parameters controlled by sensors and automation, things like temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, they were rock solid stable. How stable? Very low variability. The coefficient of variation, the CV, was only around 1.7 to 3.6%. Super tight control. Okay, impressive. But what about the biologically driven parameters, the nitrogen compounds? Completely different picture. Ammonium nitrite. Nitrate. These showed huge variability between the different trials. CVs were ranging from 100 to 200%. Wow. 100 to 200% variability. That's a lot. What does that tell us? It tells us that while the physical system is stable, the biological engine, the biofilter, is much more dynamic, especially between different experimental runs, which likely started with biofilters at different maturation stages. So the nitrifying microorganisms, mm -hmm. they take time to establish and stabilize. Weeks, sometimes months. And that maturation state dramatically impacts how the system handles nitrogen. So even in this highly controlled facility, the biofilter stage of development introduces significant variability early on. That's a critical finding. Yeah, yeah. It affects reproducibility, especially for shorter trials or ones run soon after system startup. Absolutely. It's a major caution. You need to account for biofilter stabilization time in your experimental design. So wrapping up this mud of it all, 
Evaluation doesn't just give us blueprints for a research facility. It provides a validated framework, a statistical benchmark for designing better RAS research, especially around pathogens and welfare. Right. It helps bridge that gap between controlled experiments and the realities of commercial production by providing data you can actually trust. It shows how to generate statistically verifiable results. And thinking bigger picture. Well, facilities like this, integrating advanced tech and proving out biosecurity protocols, are foundational for the industry's future. This is how we develop reliable production strategies, how we de-risk investment, and frankly, how we train the people needed to run these complex systems. It sets a standard, which leads to a final thought. Given that huge variability in the nitrogen cycle linked to biofilter startup, mm -hmm. that 100, 200 per cell TV, mm -hmm. the big remaining challenge seems to be really digging into those biofilter kinetics. Mm. How does that early stage microorganism community development interact with everything else you might be testing, like chemical treatments? We need to quantify that interaction better. Absolutely right. Even in the most controlled environments, the biology, specifically that biofilter maturation, remains a key variable we need to understand much more deeply. It's perhaps the biggest challenge for achieving consistent results, especially in early phase trials. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.